Greetings, Bill Hosko, candidate for mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Today is April 6, 2021, and this will be shortly here, uh, the beginning of my day 40 of door knocking this big, beautiful city. Uh, in my third email, I mentioned, uh, read an email to you from a woman named Nicole, and at the end of her email, she uh, submitted some questions. Today, I will answer those for you and for Nicole. She begins, increasing patrolling in high crime areas does not reduce crime. It only perpetuates the stigma of lower socioeconomic groups turning to crime. What funding will you be using to increase manpower to achieve this action? I understand the mayor's staff is upwards of 80 people. 20 would seem more than sufficient for my needs. That's where the funding will begin. The mayor's number one job in this city is to ensure the safety and security that the public feels safety, uh, safe and secure in their neighborhoods. And I know with certainty that people living in higher crime neighborhoods want to see a greater police presence, not a lesser police presence. Nicole goes on, number two, regarding the city budget process, Regular audits and recommendations by outside parties provides comprehensible information that the citizens of St. Paul understand. High-level budgetary conversations will only disenfranchise those who may be the most impacted by the budgetary process and give a more powerful voice to those who are more literate in the process. How will citizens participate in the budget process? Well, I think the question is beyond what they do currently, which is very, very few people do. The city's website needs to be upgraded to allow a public interaction between you and City Hall. Uh, many of us are aware of a online video sharing site called YouTube. And in that, it allows you to do this, do that, or add your own comment. And then conversations often ensue between the persons posting the videos and or amongst the people commenting themselves. In a nutshell, that's what I would like to see the city web, the website upgraded to. In a month or so, I'm gonna have a live, live streamed forum here at Music Forest Cafe, Hospital Gallery, going into more detail on this. And again, what I do know is that the great majority of people in St. Paul don't participate in the budget process and what I am projecting will increase participation a thousand percent and then in the future when the mayor submits his or her budget to the City Council that budget is as reflective as what the population uh, desires um, every bit or more so than what the mayor's uh, office desires Nicole goes on, city crime, uh, city crime area is already published by the police, so why reinvent the wheels? Nicole is referring to, in my flyer I talk about, we need to have a citywide crime map. Uh, why reinvent the wheels? Well, currently, my understanding is, from what I've seen, the city does, but police, they do issue maps that delineate particular types of crime you know, homicides, burglaries, thefts, assaults, etc. But these maps do not overlap. And they don't begin from January 1st until the December 31st of each year. And I've seen another outside entity, they publish uh, a daily crime map in St. Paul. But these maps only go back 30 days and they don't overlap those 30 days. So what I'm thinking of is taking the best of both of those efforts and overlapping them so that uh, in an easy way when people go to the city's website there will be a, an obvious link crime map you click on that it's a city map and any police report that is submitted from January 1st until December 31st appears on that map unfortunately right now there would be a sea of dots across St. Paul it'd be shocking to many people if they could if they if they could visually see this as you zoom in onto the area, any like your neighborhood, the dots will spread out. Any dot you touch will take you to an abbreviated version of the crime report. 
How are you going to finance this initiative and what do you believe the impact uh, to be? Nicole asks. Again, it appears the expenditures to create what I've just success, uh, exist, uh, suggested are already out there at the police level. And then there are city website managers out there. If there is a shortfall, I would be happy to contribute from my mayor's salary to fill that gap. The impact to be, well, for most people it would be obvious. It would be one comprehensive place at a glance, easily defined, a map of where all the crime is occurring in this city uh, up to each day, from year to year. Past years are just pushed back. They're never, they're never taken away. So trends would be able to be uh, very uh, noticeable to people. Um, it would be, it'd be, well, this would be a shocking thing for people to see, but it would also be reassuring to people that they can be kept abreast as much as possible by the existence of this crime map. Nicole goes on, St. Paul organized trash is still a work in progress. St. Paul was the only city in the metro area which did not have organized trash. It was long overdue to be enacted. She asks, how will you determine who can opt out and who, who cannot? And what kind of data will you be using to make this determination? How will the fee structure be more equitable? <clears throat> in our first 90 days, that's an initiative I, I, I will begin the day after I'm sworn in. In our first 90 days, city staff, the citizens, and my office will have an honest and frank discussion about what is working in St. Paul and what is not working in St. Paul and how best do we address what is not working in St. Paul. And part of that discussion will be the trash program, how best do we improve the fee structure, and how best can we possibly have an opt-out program for individuals who qualify? And that discussion will determine also who can qualify. But what's what we have now is many people are still unhappy with. The, major, the majority do support now organized trash, um, but still many people are unhappy with the fee structure. And it, it's, it's too bad that people who were who generated very little trash, who were excellent recyclers, or you know, a lot of times senior citizens generated so little trash, they would give it to their neighbor, and now these people are paying much more for trash hauling than they used to. So it's, it's, it's a conversation that needs to be held. Um, not in a bad way, not in, not in a uh, adversarial way, but just, just a um, part of this frank discussion about what's working in St. Paul and what's not. Nicole goes on, why end the individual assessment for public works projects and what do you think the impact will be? Financial tax collection and fairness of the process and what will be what will be replacing individual assessment with? Certainly most citizens in St. Paul agree individual property tax assessment for public works projects literally outside their front door on public property is inherently not fair. Part of that in our first 90 days initiative that I will be leading, we're gonna have an honest and frank discussion about this. I think most people would like that individual assessment to go away and that the costs for what occurs out in front of your homes is borne by the entire city you know, at a very small level within the property tax bill. Metro Transit funding goes on, Nicole. Metro Transit funding, um, I'm going to read this. Metro Transit funding, like transit agencies in most metropolitan areas, relies heavily on state and federal money to finance its operations and capital programs. About one third of Metro Transit operating, Transit's operating budget is covered by fares and advertising revenue. The remainder comes from regional, state, federal, county, and other sources. The city can make recommendations to the Met Council. Uh, Nicole is referring to in my flyer where I talk about buses have been retrofitted with doors, clear doors to protect drivers from assault. It's a shame what mass transit in the Twin Cities has come to that this is now accepted. 
that we need to protect the drivers from assault. And then the trains are considerably worse. When they were planning to put bring light rail to St. Paul, I argued at length with uh, every, everyone from uh, Governor Tim Paul to, to Mayor Chris Coleman and the Metropolitan Council, you cannot have an honor system where you, you know, expect people to pay before they get on to the train. Um, most cities, or all cities that require payment to use mass transit, they do have uh, fences and gates. You have to pay to go through the gate to get onto the platform to get onto the train. And without that, uh, you put temptation in front of people, and this is being abused now, and it's, it's widespread. And arguably, it's also responsible then for high levels of crime and misconduct on the trains. And frankly, it's, it can be violent as well. You own the trains, ladies and gentlemen. You own the bus service here as well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we need to ask uh, Metropolitan Council to step up their game. The Metropolitan Council is appointed by the governor and their number one, collectively, their number one responsibility in this area is to ensure the safety and well-being of the public, the paying public who ride mass transit. Nicole finishes with, and in your opinion, what is a true success? She's referring to, um, there's a photo here of the interior of Union Depot with me doing this, and my explanation that the Union Depot's renovation, which uh, ended in 2012, cost $250 million. And annually since then, it's, it's losing millions of dollars. Um, backing up in history a little bit, in 1999, I had a meeting with Mayor Norm Coleman. Uh, and part of that conversation included, I asked him to take Union Depot under his wing. At the time, Union Depot, the structure itself is T-shaped. The top of it was publicly owned, and then the base of it was the concourse, that's you know a block long, was owned by the post office. And underneath that concourse was a three block long area that the post office owned. And that's where their semis would deliver mail to the downtown sorting facility next door to Union Depot. They would drive up onto the platform, turn around, unload the mail, and then take out the mail after it was sorted. And in October of 2000, Mayor Norm Coleman had a press conference where he announced we're going to get Amtrak back at Union Depot in eight months' time, 18 months' time. It took, excuse me, about five years actually. Um, at his press conference were drawings I gave to him that month outlining in detail how do you make Union Depot work as a transit hub, but also as a needed, necessary tourist attraction so that it would be financially viable. He then afterwards turned the project over to the Ramsey County Commissioners, whose architects and designers did the opposite of what I suggested, and now we have an economic failure on our hands. It's a beautiful building, but uh, you own it, ladies and gentlemen. and. These, these annual millions of dollars in losses, they need not continue. So I will work in partnership and you with the Ramsey County Commissioners to make it a financial success. When I have this public forum here in another month's time, maybe in June, I'm gonna go in detail over those drawings I submitted to Norm Coleman, Mayor Norm Coleman, and walk you through what I was suggesting then and show you why it's still relevant today but perhaps during that time, some of you will have recommendations as well as how do we take this uh, beautiful but largely unused facility and make it something that uh, is really a, a showpiece for the city of St. Paul. Um, that's my question and answer session today. I'll be back again very soon with another one. Cheers.